Well, good evening and uh, welcome to everyone. I'm Jill Snyder. I'm executive director here at MOCA. And uh, it's great to see you here for another of our exciting uh, business innovation programs. Um, the origin of tonight's talk begins with my visit to the Venice Biennale in 2015, where I experienced Simon Denny's brilliant installation representing his native New Zealand. In recent years, Denny's research-based art projects have explored aspects of technological innovation, um, uh, evolution and obsolescence, corporate and tech industry culture, national identity, and the internet. His internationally acclaimed biennial project, Secret Power, was partly prompted by the impact of NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden's leaks of PowerPoint slides outlining top secret US telecommunications surveillance programs to the world media. I invited Simon to visit Cleveland to explore working with MOCA on a new project, potentially focused on our local technology culture. Simon found Cleveland to be a compelling location as an emerging new hub for business tech and as recent host to the Republican convention featuring a controversial speech by tech entrepreneur Peter Thiel that elevated the impact of big data as a tool in the last presidential election. During the interval following Simon's site visit to Cleveland, I was introduced to Young Jin Yu, tonight's other speaker, at a Digital C retreat. We shared our mutual passion for creative collaboration and upon discovering Young Jin's research interests in the societal use of technology and design, I immediately thought of connecting him to Simon. I cannot begin to describe the creative sparks that flew during our first Skype meeting. From that encounter, the idea of designing an MBA course at Weatherhead to capitalize on their shared interdisciplinary interests evolved. Young Jin's hunger to push the business school environment toward more creative expression had found its first subject. The exhibition, Simon's exhibition, scheduled at MOCA this spring will take shape through several bodies of work. Featured um, uh, will be um, a series of board game sculptures that analyze and diagram tech entrepreneurial worldviews related to Peter Thiel and the strategic moves of game theory. There will also be a component include including experimental designs produced by Weatherhead and Cleveland Institute of Art students under Simon's direction in the laboratory environment of Thinkbox during his residency this week in Cleveland. So as you see, this is an unusual collaboration and a uniquely compelling prototype that we hope will establish a foundation upon which to build an interdisciplinary program. Now a few words about the speakers before we begin uh, their conversation. Uh, Young Jin Yu's research interests include digital innovation and entrepreneurship, organizational genetics, societal use of technology and design. He was ranked number one in the world in 2010 for his research productivity published in top journals. As a CWRU professor in entrepreneurship, he holds a joint uh, appointment at University Hospitals of Cleveland as innovation architect overseeing their digital transformation efforts. Simon Den Denny lives and works in Berlin. He has been um, exhibiting in New Zealand and then uh, after his move to Germany, um, he's, uh, his uh, exhibition history expanded to other Western European countries. He's had solo shows around the world in Beijing, Berlin, and New York. He was included in the 2008 Sydney Biennial, the 2009 Brussels Biennial, and the 56th Venice Biennale. His work um, featured in a solo survey exhibition in early 2015 at MoMA PS1 titled The Innovator's Dilemma. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Simon and Young Jin. Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot my last and very important part. <laughs> I do want to offer a few thanks. Um, I'd like to uh, thank those of our board of directors who are here tonight, who make all that we do possible, and particularly like to acknowledge Joanne Cohen and Morris Wheeler for their advisory role in this project. 
uh, Patrick Barrett uh, from the Cleveland Institute of Art who has partnered with Young Jin on the class that he's been teaching. And also just a general thank you to the CWRU Weatherhead School of Business and, th and CWRU's Think Box. And finally to <coughs> our Business Innovation Committee and if you could just stand up or raise your hand, those of you here tonight, Scott Bogart, Tim Boyle, Yuval Brisker, Kathleen Feudy, David Loomis, Clive Miles, Mark Ross, and John Williams. I think most of you are here tonight. Thank you so much for lending you. Oh, and Steve Washington, sorry. Steve Washington, our board president. So um, I, uh, this is a great cohort who is really leading the way in helping us build relevancy for what we do here at Cleveland that really focuses on innovation and its connection to the business community. Thank you, and Simon, now. Wow, um, <clears throat> thank you, Jill, um, and thank you to all the people that she thanked. Um, <laughs> particularly thank you to, uh, yeah, Mocha, Case Weatherhead, CIA, Yonchin. Um, I'm just gonna talk first um, a little bit, give a slightly different presentation, but one that I recently gave um, at the European Parliament um, in Brussels. Um, and it's about kind of, um, meme warfare and trolling. Um, and then we're gonna kind of talk a little bit about um, the, yeah, the coming paradigms of the internet and how communication might, yeah, uh, change as, uh, as systems change. So, um, the transformations in our current era of the ways that we produce information and knowledge have challenged our ideas of who is thought to be someone who knows and therefore who should rule. Um, we're at a crossroads in how public communications works. Uh, the way that messages travel across our Web 2.0 infosphere has recently matured, um, both in a grassroots peer-to-peer -peer messaging space and in the space of traditional center-to-margin media public figures of, and traditional news platforms. Um, the formats that dominate this new plateau are things like fake news, memes, and trolling. Um, these are now the most potent tools of communication, the choice technologies that shape thoughts and opinions at scale. Um, so to put it all in one container, um, meme logic has taken over communication. Um, Richard Dawkins coined the term in 76 uh, with a conception of memes as akin to genes or as units of information with a symbol, image, uh, icon, phrase, or idea that if it fit, um, proliferate through society, co-opting all strata of media space. Um, so. Uh, Notably, memes play out in a way that resembles the activity of radical left artistic movements uh, from the mid 20th century, which aimed at critiquing the establishment of the time. For example, tactics like detourment, meaning um, rerouting or hacking. Um, here, here a fake news pamphlet from 1975 by a situationist in Italy that was made with the intent of influencing popular opinion by attributing violence um, to an industrialist. Um, but uh, today, this logic factors into how even the most powerful figures operate. Um, Trump being a signal example, as we see in how every declaration, including his dramatic withdrawal uh, recently from the Paris Climate Agreement, for example, um, seems less about the issues that they purport to address than about capturing attention and demonstrating power. Um, through his infamous direct Twitter usage, um, Trump profits off his deep meme of legacy media groups, which means uh, media groups equals fake news. Um, adding extra value um, uh, every time he tweets. Um, and indeed, within the same 24-hour period, um, as withdrawing from the Paris Climate Agreement, Trump's tweet about the uh, negative press kofifi, likely a typo, garnered equal attention. Um, the urgent issues around climate change um, was leveled, if not marginalized, amid the attention friendly around the meaning of the word kofife. Trump constantly succeeds in flipping expectations and seducing by amusing across platforms. He's a living troll meme aggregator. Um, and I would say power today rests on the ability to read the ebbs and flows of mood and opinion so as to anticipate what is coming, find a wave that is useful to amplify, and capitalize on the temporary force and intensity of numbers. Um, and that's my little diagram of uh, contemporary um, mimetic political messaging. Um, it's a practice of politics analogous not coincidentally to high frequency trading on financial markets or venture capital speculation. Um, 
The emergence of these forms and their potency are indivisible from the technology that underpins our moment. The protocols of today's communication landscape, emerging from the values and biases of the seed communities of um, the actors in Silicon Valley and beyond that shape them. The current web, the social web, epitomized by Facebook, make the conditions for these logics play out today. Uh, with the exp uh, exponential growth of information sources and free digital distribution, human attention has become the scarcest and most desired asset of the online economy. Aggregation and control of global attention flow are the number one online businesses because wherever attention flows, money flows. Multi-billion dollar valuations of companies such as Google and Facebook result from their ability to attract, package, and sell attention for dollars. Um, so here I've made a little video that tries to frame where we're at with memeing and meme-like logic um, as a form of mass communication. I hope it kind of adds to the depth um, and the way the production and, and participation of memes and culture today is currently understood. Our political community is a dialogic body. Ideas and attitudes are exchanged via competing memes. Potent cultural units that scale and mutate through imitation and use. With the ascendancy of accelerating digital networks, memes have changed in nature and behavior. If we want to preserve the body politic as a collective force, we need to engage in, not ignore, the dialogue of memes. However, super virus-like internet memes spawned from 4chan style image boards are finding their way past our body politics defense systems, exploiting vulnerabilities we do not yet know how to fix. Faster than we can figure out what these memes are, they rewrite discursive rules, create divergence and polarization, and inspire silos and filter bubbles. Memes like SJW, fake news, or shill narrow interpretive possibilities and enable their host to circumvent the agonistic engagement that is at the core of democratic interchange. The body politic needs an immune system capable of generating mimetic antibodies, preserving dialogic health and cohesion. What could this defense system look like? Current leftist attempts to counter meme on mainstream social media platforms tend to use complex historical terms appealing mainly to insiders. Rather than inviting new people in, these efforts often expel anyone seeming to compromise a narrowing set of core values, resulting in a subdivided community with a limited range of defenses. In turn, our antibody-producing B-cells are becoming isolated hamster wheels of likes and positive reinforcement Wherever more people compete for less in an inconsequential simulation of politics. We need to become literate in new mimetics. We need to understand the format and structure of the anonymous message boards that are producing the mimetic super language of today's right. In this special architecture, an anon can participate in truly collective production with upvoting and feedback that is not reliant on reputation-based or economic incentives. Anonymous message boards reward the organic, simple, potent packages that cause thinking to become viral. They could encourage a methodology that predicts weaknesses in the messaging and internal logics of the left. If executed well, a core community could here become the left's critical trolls a front line of Anons on this mimetic battleground, capable of generating emergent meta-feedback and thereby ensuring the dialogic health of our shared democratic body politic. Um, anyway, uh, so that's a, that's a little um, animation that I made in collaboration with an advertising company um, to kind of make sort of propaganda for literacy in contemporary media, especially among artists, because I think there could be a role that artists play um, in, in battling in these kind of um, environments. So um, emergent languages grow organically from the conditions and logics of their host protocols. Searching for how to combat meme logic and communication has become a frustrating preoccupation of artists around me. For example, take the photographer Wolfgang Tillmans, an artist with a broad crossover into pop culture. 
He is known for his nuanced images of contemporary life and also fashion kind of crossovers. Um, trading on his mainstream attention, he has produced a series of simple posters distributed across Instagram and other social net networking sites, as well as analog postering. Through Tillm uh, uh, though Tillman's utilized his um, easily recognizable aesthetic, highly valued by a broad fan base, his message advertising um, UK voters on the downside of leaving the EU was nevertheless met with broad criticism from the artistic community that he was merely preaching to the converted. Um, coming to the political with a very different approach, like um, take a recent talk by a Berlin-based artist, Daniel Keller, who was a friend of mine who engaged in right-wing meme culture directly both in terms of its language and its primary site of production. For example, message boards like 4chan. The critique this time came from 4chan itself. Um, his poll in, in the poll thread, uh, where a lot of the right wing memes were first developed. Um, among the tons of dismissive responses to Keller's proposed method of counter memeing, there was Rum's response that hinted at a key insight. And that is that um, their strength comes from the format and structure of uh, anonymous image boards themselves. And if they want to kind of counter, um, then they should hang out on um, other similar like formats. Um, the feedback given raised restated that anonymous image boards are key to producing organic emergent viral languages. Um, the technology breeds its own language. Instead of imitating the formats of successful existing memes, equipping a seed community with the technology that grows this kind of messaging in a bottom-up fashion might be a more effective strategy. This could suit the legions of artists and art students which today spend their time trying to produce luxury goods for luxury markets. In a, fraction, in a fraction of that time, uh, if a fraction of, of that time and resources could instead go into organic language creation, exploring these protocols, this could be a solid step in building an alternative language that was not force memed. Um, an even more effective strategy might be starting early when experimenting in the coming paradigms of the future of the internet and mediascape. Um, into meshing ourselves into the growth of tomorrow's protocols. As I mentioned earlier with Trump, memes follow a logic of financial speculators, being about fro following forms of attention and piggybacking them as they rise, just like growth industries or businesses. The next paradigm of the web, Web 3.0, will be about integrating financial logic and thus speculative logic into communication. And this started with Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin proved it's possible to program human behaviors, or proved yet again that it's possible to program human behaviors um, using economic incentives embedded in software. Um, its software, um, the blockchain, is poised to fuse with the existing internet and birth a new Web 3.0, the web of value, where money and communication runs on the same infrastructure. This, is, this new web, likely populated with many liquid currencies or tokens that gather around interest groups or projects, um, data will become monetizable in a whole different way and financial value will be coupled much more closely to attention. In a world like today where we signal our interest and attention with likes on centralized platforms, choke points that then harvest and sell that attention, tomorrow's web will be a place where we own, package and sell our own attention, monetizing our own data, hopefully. Uh, mimetic messaging will not only become more, it will only become more, not less endemic to tomorrow's communication infrastructure. Projects like userfeeds.io are building this next web um, with reputation currencies that aim to enable the individuated um, financialization of fi Facebook likes and feeds. It's a nascent industry, but the growth of the Ethereum platform, and, uh, which is the programmable version of Bitcoin in a way, that will be the protocol that platforms like user feeds will be built on is kind of exponential. And um, yeah, uh, I don't know if you guys follow Ethereum, but it's increased in value. Um, it's by something like 8,000% um, this year or something. Um, artists should uh, beta test this space, collaborating with those that are building the emergent web, growing first the new language it demands. Um, so the most important takeaway that I want to say um, from this idea is to be literate in these developments early, to know emergent super languages on these new protocols as they develop. Um, when I gave this talk at the European Parliament as a part of the Next Generation Internet Summit in early June, I combined it with a performance which mirrored the underlying logic of being aware of which technologies privilege certain modes of communication and how to use these technologies and logics as a form of constructive feedback. Conferences are often accompanied by the particle, uh, like by the practice of visual facilitation, a live illustration and summary of events as they happen into a visual infographic like diagram. In the parliament, a small group of artists and critics, some of which I have referenced today, 
um, collaborated with me um, and a top visual facilitator um, to not only summarize the urgent point at the summit's talk, but also to critique and identify possible misinterpretations, co-option, and adaptations of messages from the parliamentary speakers. This formatted a kind of microcosm of what is happening on today's networks, contained in a format native to the medium of the annotated conference talk. It tried to enact a performative example of addressing a medium on its own terms, um, to adapt, apply critical facilities of one discipline, and take it across to an emergent communication scape of another. Um, and here's um, an image of me speaking in the parliament with, uh, with this, um, yeah, with this uh, uh, illustrator, this live illustrator, and the drawings that were made in the parliament, plus this video that I just um, played to you, were shown at a museum down the street as well. Um, this is an example of some of the uh, drawings we produced. Um, here they are in the, in the space of the parliament, so being kind of feedback live um, while, the, while the people in the parliament were speaking. Um, these are some kind of uh, yeah, close-ups of the type of drawings that were made, and uh, yeah, and some commentary that I then put on it um, in a kind of walkthrough installation um, that was then uh, within the, the Bozar, which is uh, this museum space down the street. So yeah, that's my uh, introduction, and I don't know how we're going to talk about this, but I have no idea. <laughs> so I have no idea. I I taught um, eight hours uh, in our e executive education today, and um, you know my uh, uh, nonsense bullshit quota exceeded. Um, so um, you know. So you didn't I listen to any of that. Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> no, not not yours. Just uh, my ability, my quota to speak uh, nonsense exceeded. Um, you know, I think uh, as I was listening, um, uh, what I gathered was the, t the parallel between that I drew between what you ask the artist to do and what I think the business should do and what uh, our responsibility in business school um, is. That is, uh, you know, just today uh, we talked about uh, where is the future and, and the discussion is like, you know, whether uh, the, the technology made us dumb uh, and, and we play with that, uh, you know, society. And I said, you know, there is no such a thing as a future that is waiting for us. The companies, uh, the big corporations and small, uh, we shape the future. And, and by creating, you know, this kind of product and iPhones and so on, we indeed uh, shape the future. Uh, and then I, I said, uh, you know, look, when Steve Jobs went onto the stage on 2000 seven to tell the world that he believes uh, a, a phone without physical keyboard is superior than the phone with, uh, without a physical keyboard. Um, that is a value-laden statement that he made, and he made a goal to make it popular and decided that the wor whole world will adopt that particular view so that he would become successful. And, and I, I believe that um, you know, the business is in the, uh, in the business of making and shaping the world, and we are very much in the business uh, of shaping those uh, languages and super languages. And all the examples that you uh, used are exactly are in for-profit business, right? And, and sometimes we forget, you know, sometimes our students don't think about it. Uh, a lot of times business people think that, oh, I'm not in the business of shaping the world or culture. I'm just making money, but we are, in fact, you know, um, in, in the business of shaping culture. And, and I said, you know, in uh, 20, uh, 30, 50 years later, people will discover, like, you know, uh, iPhone in museum. And, that's, and then they will start interpreting what that meant and why did they do what, uh, what, uh, what we do. So um, it, this is oftentimes uh, a neglected aspect of the business. And uh, I think the forum like this and, the, the, you know, the reason that I thought our uh, collaboration um, in the class was exciting was that the students uh, get to see that what they're doing is in fact shaping the future of how people would live. So that would be my right. beginning line of response to your talk. Yeah, I mean, one of, the, one of the points that I tried to make in the presentation and one of the kind of ongoing themes in my work is, um, is that, you know, uh, information technology shapes culture, right? And that's kind of what you just said. Um, I mean, not only information technology, but today information technology, it plays a huge role. So, um, and uh, my general argument is that we should keep up with what these things are and kind of try and involve different types of minds in, in, in thinking about what those futures can be. 
and I think um, that not that not only uh, relates to kind of artists um, and people that are not trained within te technology or business, but also in terms of backgrounds and uh, you know people people that grow up in different situations with different socioeconomic you know advantages and disadvantages, um, cultural information as well. I just think uh, if we can keep a broad input into what these things are, um, that that will make a, a better future. Um. So you know, as I was listening, um, one of the things that I thought about was that um, you know it is easy to criticize technology and say that you know um, it is being abused and hijacked, and therefore we should reject the technology. And as a person who's teaching technology innovation, I find that position extremely difficult to accept. And if you look at the history of, of recent history, you know, it, uh, it is e almost impossible to deny the positive effect the technology had. You know, like, you know look, when I came to, uh, 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 to this country in 1992, when I first came, there was no way we could get, uh, you know, today's news from Korea um, um, at home. Uh, and, and, um, and 94, something called uh, Internet Browser Mosaic came. And I was uh, able to get uh, daily news updated, um, you know, once a, once a day. Now it's just a matter of uh, seconds, you know, this information is available to us. And it, uh, and then, you know, we have routine phone calls, video calls from friends and relatives, you know, all across the world. And I met more, uh, you know, friends, high school friends that I lost contact with through Facebook and, and we, we talk routinely. So there, there, you know, we, we cure uh, disease, we extend lives. But at the same time, we have to be extremely mindful, um, you know, about the side effect. And, and uh, perhaps I think uh, it would be interesting for us to share the f one of the first conversation that we had. That was about uh, Peter Thiel. Um, and he asked me, um, you know, how I came to him and what, what, um, what I think about his his work, and um, you know, I what I told him, and in fact, um, the conversation came because he asked me how do I teach design in business school, and I used the title of Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One, and I said, you know, the majority of the business is designed to not to innovate, not to create new things. The business is designed to uh, uh, scale. Business is designed to operate. And this is exactly the thesis that Peter Thiel advance, uh, advances in his book, Zero to One. He said, you know, most organizations are designed based on the logic of one to N, um, but he's advocating to pay attention to the moment of one, zero to one. And he says there is in, uh, entirely different logic that we need to employ and, and, and need to teach and learn. And so I said to, um, you know, you, Simon, I said, that's what I believe and uh, you know, uh, the, the, the role of design, and then you said something very different. Uh, <laughs> maybe perhaps you can share that. I problem. can't remember what I said, um, but I mean, I, I mean, I think t you know, for me, teal um, and the position of teal comes with a context. I guess maybe that's what I said. I don't know, but um, the the ideas in zero to one come in a whole kind of political framework, um, which relates to uh, yeah different types of theories, and I was looking at that moment into a teacher of his, uh, this guy, Rene Girard, and I was thinking about, because I was thinking about memes and memetics, uh, Rene Girard was a professor at Stanford, taught Peter Thiel, but also um, w thought about mimesis as a theory and, c and copying as a theory. And, um, you know, the idea that um, Thiel was an early investor in Facebook and the idea that he saw the, the, the mimetic drive of people to copy other people being, uh, being something that was um, a real motivator and a driver of, of desire on the planet and everybody in the world. Um, and that if you could see and kind of map what other people were doing outside of your economic and social space or your political space or your, your geographic space um, and, and kind of be closely in touch with the desires of others across the planet, that would scale up mimetic desire. Um, and apparently that was kind of one of the, that's one interpretation of one of the reasons why he may have invested um, so early in, in something like Facebook. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I tried to look as far as I could in the context of this because obviously we know products like Facebook and ideas like this have this incredible amount of impact. Um, 
and uh, I like to you know look into these in a kind of way that questions their origin and questions some of their assumptions as well. And um, I think uh, some of the assumptions around um, around memetics is also that you need a scapegoat, right? So if you go a little further into um, into Girardian theory, um, the idea is that. W there's this kind of flow of buildup of desire that comes with with copying and, and mimesis. And once you kind of reach this fever pitch of everybody's kind of desire energy, um, you need a release, a societal release, right? And um, and that release comes in the form of a scapegoat. Um, and uh, I mean, interestingly, in Zero to One, um, Thiel applies this to the founder, the figure of the founder as a kind of political king-like scapegoat for um, society's problems. So if a business goes wrong, like if you're, for example, the head of Uber, and you do something crazy, and people don't like your platform, then you get all of the blame for kind of one system, right? That's one way of applying Girardian theory. Another way of applying Girardian theory could be something political, right? Where, um, uh, where you get a situation where um, you get a kind of a growing world of, of, of interconnected people across the planet whose kind of mimetic desire is building, um, and then you need a, a political scapegoat. And that political scapegoat can obviously come in the forms of things that are not so helpful, um, like, uh, like minorities and like uh, groups that have been disadvantaged. And this, this narrative that Trump, for example, used, again, to kind of connect a little bit to my talk, of the way that you know uh, people who are um, you know uh, coming in as immigrants are taking jobs, which I think is obviously kind of it's provably not true, right? Um, uh, can act as a similar release for kind of buildups of uh, of tension um, in in the system, which may have been exacerbated by the systems that we're using. So I don't know if that's what uh, I said, but <laughs> that's yeah, what yeah, I, I think. think. Uh, close enough. Uh, uh, but but you know we discussed and we got. And it made it, but you know, I think what what I also got was, you know, one of the the basic sort of um, um, logic of um, economics and and management is that the value comes from scarcity. Um, so something that is a scarce makes it more uh, desirable and, and more valuable. Uh, that's how the industrial uh, economy uh, used to operate. When you apply that logic to you know, things like Google or Facebook, it just doesn't scale, it doesn't work. Because uh, Facebook is free, Google is free. There's an infinite supply of digital goods. Um, why does it have to be valuable? You know, a multi-billion dollar company that doesn't produce anything scarce. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that the dialogue that we had and the, your introduction, uh, you know, uh, to uh, Rene Girard's work, really was an eye-opening uh, sort of, uh, for me, um, way to think about uh, some of the, the questions I had, you know, theoretical questions like, uh, how do we explain what makes it valuable? And if maybe it, it has nothing to do or little to do with what is being scarce, but more about uh, being desired, being, you know, uh, what others are doing and, and perfect illustration of what is happening in the, in the internet, so. I mean, one of the things I want to say as well is that one of the things I tried to mention in this uh, in this slide group, and one of the things I think I really strongly agree with you on, is that um, you know, I think things that we expect from technological systems often end up being something else. And this is what I was trying to make the point about um, the way that our information system, in terms of communication, grew. Right. So um, you know. With the birth of the internet, um, we thought that kind of um, it, it would it, it would enable people to talk to each other in different regions and 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 have this kind of flat exchange of information and value. Um, and uh, you know, for the first little bit of the internet, um, that was maybe true for the network that it was c capturing. But as we know, um, as the internet has grown, actually, it's kind of turned not into a kind of um, uh, a space where there's many different actors interacting. There are many different actors interacting, but there is also kind of like centralized choke points uh, in, w in which they act on. So something which was dreamed of as radical decentralization has actually turned into something which is a centralizing effect, where you get um, you know, many, you know, only a few core companies um, at at the value hubs of, of of everything that's happening on the on the web, right? So I think that's really interesting, and I think that again, what I was trying to advocate for in my talk earlier 
um, is that uh, we need to learn the way those things uh, are evolving and we need to kind of adapt to them. Um, and, uh, and blockchain, which is one of the things I mentioned very briefly in there, is one of the technological attempts, as far as I understand it, to kind of counter this, um, this action. And I think um, that will probably also bring us to a place where we don't expect, um, but it might not be the same type of centralization that's happening in the moment. I wonder, we've had a few dialogues on this, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the one thing that uh, you know, we can think about is that, in fact, uh, if you look at empirical data, uh, the data would suggest that there is even more concentration of power uh, in, from an economic standpoint. Uh, companies like uh, Google and Facebook, and you know, um, the, the scale by which they control the market is uh, is something that we have never seen before in an industrial economy. You know, the, the uh, you know, big three never commanded that level of control at a global scale. Um, so in a way, it is amazing how we can uh, forget, you know, that the, and, and live under the illusion, romantic illusion that the, you know, the internet is for, uh, you know, democratizing the economic uh, activities. Um, so, so many years ago, one of my doctor students um, looked at um, um, how uh, the, the, the internet um, news uh, are being shared. Um, and what we found was that, you know, so the, the, the popular uh, the sort of naive uh, interpretation of the role of internet in, in mass media uh, at the time was that, oh, you know, now we are challenging, uh, challenging the elites and gatekeepers and it is becoming, um, you know, democratic. What we found was that it is exactly the opposite. Actually, it is consolidated by a few actors. In fact, we don't even know who they are. Uh, they are hidden behind the layers of technology. These are very, very popular people. We, we looked at how certain news become very popular in the internet space. And what happens is that typically, a person who's very heavily connected, heavily followed, typically blogger, not even have any responsibility whatsoever. We, don't, we know very little about that person's uh, uh, orientation or, or uh, you know, who's funding that person. But when that person blog about an article, that article becomes the very popular in the blog space. Uh, at least we know who these editors are. Uh, we at least know, you know, what these people. So on one hand, it is incredibly liberating. Anybody can, in a way, have a shot at uh, uh, showing up on the, f uh, the front page of YouTube. Uh, my son, uh, when he was eight, he was a programmer. I told you this story. Uh, there is a, a software platform called uh, Roblox, and it's an open source uh, children's uh, sort of pr uh, programming platform. Uh, when he was eight, uh, one day, summer day, he walked up, uh, walked me up, you know, knocking my door, and, and he said, Dad. And what happened was, it was amazing. I uh, watched him during the summer. Every day, he would get like 10, 20 emails from um, every, you know, a lot of people around the globe sending him a piece of software code, asking him to fix it. And he acted it uh, as like a tech support for the company for a whole summer. Every morning he gets up, log on, and, and, and you know, by 10, 30, he's like, boy, I'm, I'm done. And then he become a little child again. <laughs> and and, and I'm, it was amazing to see how eight-year-old have that much of an influence. Now, the, the uh, key child message labor, here. right? Yeah, no, child sorry. labor, <laughs> yeah. The key here is, though, we don't know how he became that famous, or that, uh, that little moment of fame. It's like, uh, I don't know how my article showed up on somewhere, and someone blogged, and that remains as a mystery, right? So um, it's, it's, a, it's a very dangerous illusion that we have, that you know, this is uh, you know, democratizing in one way it is, but on the other hand, there are always powerful figure who actually consolidating this power. I think that's a perfect segue into what I was doing last night, um, <laughs> but uh, which was watching um, the, the the Senate hearings of the three um, of, of Facebook, Twitter, and Google, and talking about the Russian probes um, and and the and the Russian um, gamification and uh, or like whatever the, the Russian use of, um, of kind of fake news and generation and scaling of fake news on those platforms. And it was really a very, very interesting dialogue that relates to everything I'm kind of, everything we're speaking about. But this idea that one can become literate um, 
in these things and, and learn how to use those systems, I think is real, right? And, and that's exactly what those kind of hackers did. So you can, I mean, I also had a meeting last week um, in New York with um, a, a guy that works selling advertising to Google, uh, to people through, through Google and, and Facebook. So you can buy keywords, right? That's one of the things that you do now is you buy keywords um, and you can also buy, um, when, when you're on Facebook, you can um, work with kind of targeted systems where, um, where your demographics or the people that like your page already have mirror demographics that you can kind of buy access to as well. So th I mean, the way that, um, that you can kind of buy and increase your influence and access was exactly the way that political influence was spreading from adversaries. So it's great that um, the Senate is looking into this more seriously now. It's, uh, and again, part of what I was trying to advocate uh, for in my, in my talk earlier was that we should be learning these systems earlier and not having, not having the people that um, we don't want to have them become literate um, and having the people that we do want um, literate, but anyway. Um, that re reminds me of a conversation we had early on where we talked about uh, when innovation was happening in where technology is reshaping behavior and the role of ethics uh, on the front end. And you talked about that in your classes and how do you, when you're anticipating the future, how do you talk about that um, playing out mm -hmm. behavior uh, knowing you're tapping, uh, maybe knowingly in desire, but there is also desire that's unknown <laughs> and uh, the direction that that takes. And how do you think about that in, in the, you know, in theoretically and in the practice of the business world? Well, I think first of all, um, you know, what we can do uh, is to uh, teach uh, our um, you know, students or uh, you know, our colleagues and uh, business leaders to play the game. And, and I found it uh, the very interesting, you know, the parallel between the way um, Simon uh, does his artwork. We simply use different language to express. So in the class, I think maybe we'll use uh, our class project as an example. So what we are doing in, uh, in the classroom, uh, uh, our students are exposed to uh, three industries. They're exploring healthcare, uh, transportation and financial service. The reason we chose those three is because uh, the uh, transportation is 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 a most representative manufacturing industry. Uh, financial service is a very important um, funding any any sort of industry, and then healthcare being a service industry. So we thought that we would choose these three, and then we asked the students to explore the future of this industry based on um, three technologies, augmented reality, robotics, and including AI and big data, uh, and blockchain technology. And in the class, what students are learning, which I think all innova uh, innovators should do, is playing out the logic of technology and economic logic all the way to the, its logical conclusion. Just playing out, so what can we do, what can we anticipate, and the winner or loser is your ability to play out longer, right? You know, so you can anticipate what is the logic of this technology, what is the logic of Uber, technological logic and economic logic, play it its uh, fullest extent as far as you can go. And then what we do in business school is to prototype it. Uh, we make a, a pitch deck, uh, and then we then uh, calculate the size of the market, you know, value proposition, but mostly we use boring two by two matrix and you know powerpoints and bullet points and if we're clever maybe we'll use some um, you know use this case scenario videos and so whatnot what i found in, in the case of uh, 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 simon's work and uh, our students are trying to do is using artistic language to express those and then i think the ethics issue is then we ask our students to question themselves, like, is this future desirable? Is this, is this something that I want to live? You know, is, is this kind of the world where my child uh, live? And, and I think we should ask those questions, at, and, and that could be a good starting point. Uh, and that segue, and the other thing that we talked about was what you give up in order to gain, this idea of the loss-gain equation, that if you ask people to, uh, to take a leap to because technology is giving them an opportunity to do something they could never do before, usually that means you're giving something else up, that a way of which you did something or, you know, and, and I, I think it's very interesting to see how that may play out in a boomerang effect that 
with uh, rampant technology, you had kind of this return to a maker culture and the need to be tactile and wanting to do it yourself. And, you know, so how do you see that cycle playing out in the dynamic of, of innovation and change? Um, well, you know, the, the just first of all, the, your question about, uh, you know, t trade off. Mm -hmm. The problem I think I see is that oftentimes we don't even know what we're giving up. You know, and we are just being told that this is good for you and, and actually never told, what am I giving up? Uh, I think we need to have a way of making it explicit. And I think, you know, recently we just wake up to the fact of, uh, you know, all these uh, privacy issues and data and so on. So I think that is very important. Um, I think the, uh, we are beginning to realize that uh, people are, uh, we are physical beings. Um, you know, you cannot eat bits. You cannot, you cannot, uh, you know, you cannot transport from one location to another. You need, uh, you need physical stuff, and uh, and um, you know, you can you can fantasize all these things and 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 uh, you know, unbounded uh, the the digital space and think about it. But I think there is a value of being grounded in the physical world, and you know, and and. You know, uh, quite frankly, I think one of the reasons I, after living 10 years in, in, in Philadelphia area, coming back to Cleveland, is that I think the, the uh, regions like Cleveland, uh, Midwest, you know, manufacturing base, I think there's a great opportunity, in fact, to tap into that movement, like we beginning to realize that there is value of producing something real, you know, value of um, you know, uh, and, and I don't think it is just, uh, you know, hip culture that young people who hipsters who want to have like a retro lifestyle and, you know, and so on. But there is something real and different when you actually deal with the physical stuff. And as uh, someone who's just studying digital innovation saying this is really bizarre, but I do not believe there is such a thing as a true digital product at all. Everything that we interact with at the end has to be translated, transmitted in physical medium. You know, even this, it looks like a digital media, but it is being transmitted in, you know, particles and, and you know, in, in, and, and we see it on physical screen. In a computer science, we call it print. So anything that is a digits in, 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 in material world has to be, whether it's a sound, whether it's an image, whether it is a physical being. So we're just becoming uh, more aware of the fact that we, we need to live on this uh, physical space that's, you know, uh, you okay if we start pitching questions to the audience, or did of you want to do a response? Yeah, no, to let's let's involve. Seem other like a good segue to uh, absolutely uh, bringing it back uh, to the audience and see if there are questions that you have. I've already well, said too much. That's <laughs> no, not too much. Um, we're just going to ask you if you would wait for the mic since we are taping this, and uh, you can raise your hand, and the mic will be brought to you. I would like to bring the conversation back to where we are in our art museum, and since I'm speaking to the execu executive director of this particular museum, I'd like to direct this question to you and to the two other guests. How has this all changed art in simple way, and what should we expect to see in an art museum, whether it's the Louvre or the Cleveland Museum of Modern Art, in five years? Uh, thank you. That's very kind of you to bring that back <laughs> to <laughs> why we're here. Um, uh, because, uh, you know, as Young Jin also generously said, it really is, I do think artists do help us to shape and see the world differently. Um, I would say, I mean, that's, that's a, a thesis question. But one specific thing I would say, and I think those in the room who do follow art is, uh, really in the last decade, if not more, the pro proliferation of digital media has shaped the, the language in which artists have been creating. And so um, I would say, if not a majority, certainly it is prolific within uh, contemporary art practice and uh, especially young emerging generations to be working in digital media. and. Uh, and in video, and so, you know, like, okay, so that's the vocabulary of the day, but think about how that shapes the visitor experience. And as you 
have a museum and you are inviting people to come in, uh, the experience of looking at art uh, is profoundly different if you are going into a darkened room and sitting down and being expected to watch something that may be, well, Simon's was two minutes, but often uh, video works are, are endurance. So there's this question of endurance and longevity and uh, focus on works of art that are time-based um, as opposed to, say what? I mean, something that is less prescribed. I find that very interesting because actually what's interesting, there's almost a flip side to that. I think that um, studies show that when you go into museums, there's maybe on average um, seven seconds in front of a two-dimensional work of art. And um, you know what does that tell us? So one of the loss and gain equations here is with digital culture, I think there's um, much um, a shorter attention span for seeing things. That's another side of it. You know, things are moving so quickly that to stand and to contemplate and to to develop visual literacy that you can actually stand and look at a static object. I think that our children are not really um, uh, habituated to doing that. Um, what's the on the other hand? Kids who come and look at video in our gallery, I mean, I'm looking at my colleague here, Joanne, who's been involved in presenting art. I mean, it's definitely generational. You have older generations, generational, who come and like, I don't want to watch the video. You know, it's like, that's not my thing. And then you have younger generations and they gravitate towards it. So there's definitely a change in the visual language that digital media uh, has presented and it, you can play it out for both um, advantage and disadvantage. Um, so that's a, a quick thought in response to, in, in the context of a museum. You could talk a lot about, well, what, how does that shape collecting? You know, how do you collect video? How do you collect digital media? How does that change the way in which you shape museums for presentation? How do you archive it? How, what does it mean to have a collection? So there are so, so many questions, but I think the more, probably the more profound one is how it engages our, um, you know, in the end of the day, art is to be having a meaningful engagement in ideas, and how does that medium advance or not advance your, uh, your connection? Yeah, I mean, I would say that's basically true. I think the biggest thing, I would say it's sh shorter. I think attention spans and objects and whatever's in front of you uh, people don't want to look at stuff, and you have to kind of like think about what is going to make people want to look and engage more, maybe. Um, so uh, one thing that um, you know I contemplated crazy ideas uh, is that uh, perhaps uh, so one of the the advantage of blockchain is that you can track who's doing what and activities and then monetize it. So you know during the uh, uh, during the uh, um, Napster time when the government is uh, prosecuting people who are downloading and copying music illegally. And I just couldn't understand why artists were upset about that, right? Because these people who are putting their, their own music onto the peer-to-peer -peer service are the, the greatest promoters of their work, except that you don't get paid for it. So I was thinking back then, you know, only if we have technology that can track which file was copied by whom and how many times it was copied, and then as long as we can pay back the money, we'll be fine, right? You know, these people should be rewarded. You should thank these people who are c promoting copying, promoting your work. You know, why do you penalize it? So applying that logic, now we have a perfect technology actually to implement it, right? So, and then you can actually say, have you ever thought about used MP3 file versus brand new MP3 file? You can actually do that now, right? Because it's a... Uh, the blockchain will actually show how many times this file was copied. So if you buy directly from the record company or artist, it's a brand new, you pay premium, but then you pay to give it to someone else, then it is a, it's a reduced price because it's a used product. Of course, the quality will not be different because it's a digital artifact. So applying it in art museum, what if, what if we create digital uh, representations and some, some arts, let people copy, you know, and, and let's create a speculative market of uh, these uh, digital copies and promote. I think we can create very different uh, business model. 
to promote arts and support artists. Um, we just need to co-opt the technology in our own advantage. We can think of all the, the wrong things that can happen from this. We should be think about it. And, and again, we need to think about whether this is ethical use of technology. Um, so I think that's, you know, just a, sort of like a straight uh, sort of business school professor talking about nonsense and, you know, innovation. <laughs> that's what I would do. Another question? So mimet mimetic communication. Um, I'm one, it's, it's a very good uh, point topic, something I didn't think about before, but I'm wondering what to make of it as a business guy, right? So for example, the examples given are very powerful people or, or very, uh, take Black Lives Matter for example, a very uh, important uh, social issue, that gets a lot of publication. But I if I were to come up with something, two or three words, is that really gonna go viral? Should I be coming up with product names that are two words? Uh, what, what do I do with this information as a business guy? Well, that's the thing. I mean, the science of mimetics is still dark, right? We don't, you know, people don't know. Um, and I mean, you can cheat by buying keywords and whatever. Like this, is, you can you can participate in digital advertising strategies that kind of amplify signals. But the best meme is the organic meme, right? And one of the kind of um, one of the things which I really uh, was looking into, and a lot of my friends look into, is like where the the, the original memes come from, right? Like. Can I has cheeseburger? Like who 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 made that up, right? Like and we don't know. And like, but actually, it was born in these technological systems. It was born within like um, anonymous image boarding, right? That was that was where that was born. So like, um, so it's something about maybe one theory might be something about the architecture of anonymous image boards it produces exactly the right environment to 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 kind of like. Yeah, ge genealogize a meme or something like some, something like that to birth a meme, right? And something about anonymous feedback, something about the fact that it's not connected to a profile, it's not connected to kind of promoting yourself, but it's only about the the message and and how kind of sticky it is. Um, and you know, many many memes are thrown into that system, or potential memes are thrown into that system, and some rise to the top and some don't, right? And like predicting what that is is very very difficult. Um, but I would say like if you wanted to kind of make a, and this is a fantasy I had, um, if you wanted to make a kind of um, a, a counter-memeing training program or something like that, um, you might create a, a kind of closed but large-scale digital message board where you kind of, uh, uh, you know, invited certain um, key actors. I would say art schools would be a great place to start in terms of recruiting. Um, and then you might, um, then you might, uh, you know, just let them play, right? And then with those similar systems, you might get memes that rise to the top that are kind of yet to um, uh, release into a into a wider net of the internet of the world, right? So you get kind of like, yeah, meme think tank image boards or something like that. Um, and so that was that would be my fantasy. But it is actually really hard. Like it's, uh, it, you know, what makes a good meme? No one can answer that right now. So it's a great business problem, I think, because if you do, you'll be a genius. So, uh, you know, there's a, a, a lot of social science work going into that right now uh, under the name of, um, um, you know, uh, big data uh, and, and computational social science. Um, you know, I have a conspiracy theory of why such uh, research have become very popular. You know, uh, NSF, a National Science Foundation, really uh, led that way, and, and uh, their uh, initiation really coincided with about the time that NSA was uh, looking into our email. So, uh, you know, I thought that they may say, oh, you know, let's give these grants to, you know, really smart people in university and see what they come up with. Uh, that's my conspiracy theory. I have no evidence for that. Um, so I, you know, we've been looking at my students, and I've been looking at this thing uh, quite a bit, and a lot of other smart people looked at it. We do know a few things. It, it follows, uh, you know, what the network people would call preferential attachment. So, you know, the, the, the winner takes all. So there are certain powerful connectors who just keep uh, collecting more nodes and they will be uh, becoming. What we do not know is how the uh, a particular node becomes such a powerful, heavily connected node. So some people did uh, experiments. So, uh, you know, uh, and, and it's, uh, it is really heavily influenced by the random initial condition. So where you happen to be and uh, in, in where you happen to, uh, you know, come across and who, who you know. And, and uh, that creates some kind of initial condition and that 
Initial condition is a very powerful uh, factor that affects what happens. We also know that the content or substance of, of the, the, the meme is less important than the structural positioning of the meme. So that's another thing that we are uh, finding. Uh, we've been doing, uh, the, my students and Kali has been, uh, you know, my department chair, uh, we've been involved in this sort of computational science where we've been looking at the mutation of open source. So, you know, the one thing that's great about, uh, you know, today's world is that we have so many data, uh, digital trace data. All of your, uh, you know, tweet, uh, you know, Facebook comments and likes and, and all that is part of our data uh, repository. Uh, that's which is great for us, um, and and you know the GitHub is one uh, world largest uh, uh, open source software project uh, repository, and what we are doing right now is how software, which is manifestation uh, uh, manifestation of ideas in uh, in in a literal sense, mutates as they become popular. So uh, it and, and we are finding it's uh, almost like a virus viral going through people and. And it really follows human human social networks. So, uh, you know, uh, you work with certain people, and those people become the contagious source of spreading these ideas. And then, as people pick up uh, these ideas, mutate. We're trying to figure out what makes uh, certain things more uh, mutatable than others. Um, I feel like this is an idea you've probably thought of before, but. What do you think would be the implication of registering memes in the blockchain? Um, sort of giving up rights to having a truly anonymous image and just being to able to trace the source of any image or idea made on the internet. How does that fit into the role of a future creative commons? Um, Dogecoin, right? I don't know. Uh, Dogecoin is, a, is, is kind of an, a really interesting meeting point of, of, of meme logic and blockchain, early, early. Like, it's a cryptocurrency that was named after a meme. Um, and, uh, and then there were actually groups, um, I know a couple companies that worked around exactly that, um, like uh, make, you know, making memes on the blockchain and following them and then adding uh, little packets of financial value uh, that were in the form of tokens, right? This is how, the, this is how you kind of monetize the blockchain or whatever. Um, uh, that uh, when, when, you're, you know, when your token gets more attention, it, it gains potential value. Um, and uh, and if, you, if you stuck that to a meme, so if you're a meme creator and you put that on the blockchain, then you might be able to accrue value for your meme creation as well. So I can't actually remember the company of that did that, but, um, but there, are, there are companies building exactly what you, you were suggesting, um, and it's a super interesting space, I think. And it will bankrupt uh, Facebook? Apparently, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so here's the thing, right? Why is Facebook that valuable? Because they're not paying the right price to uh, for the, the resource that they gather, which is all the contents we create, all the, all the, the, uh, the memes that we post, all the photos we post is being used for free. Uh, it's not free. Uh, in fact, we are paying uh, with the, our eyeballs. Um, so um, what if pa Facebook has to pay for very popular, you know, the meme that became extremely popular because that gets a lot of people come to Facebook, so I have to pay you for that, right? So once you, once someone creates that platform that would attract people, so why would I post my meme on Facebook when they rip me off and here I have an opportunity to make money, right? I will never post my, uh, my dog photo to, to Facebook anymore. I will go here because I have a chance to make money so that will bankrupt if that actually becomes as successful as Facebook, and potentially it will uh, attract a lot of uh, um, a lot of uh, content creators. I do not know, however, how people will feel about my clicking would give you financial benefits. So, like, will I click my friend's uh, photo knowing that he will financially benefit? Now, all of a sudden, this this is different, right? So we need to think through that. But, um, yeah. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. So, we've been discussing these concepts of memes and things of this. Um, I think while avoiding one of the most difficult pieces of what a meme means. I mean, at its core, uh, the internet 
when it started was said to be the great equalizer. It was the ability for anybody with any, any taste to find with granularity what they were looking for. The meme is the opposite. The meme is the personification of populism. The meme is the personification of the crowding out of the other. And I wonder if you'd uh, comment a little bit uh, on what happens when you then combine that with complex algorithms with unanticipated consequences and uh, political actors um, who seem to understand the unanticipated consequences a lot better than uh, those who designed the algorithms in the first place. Well, I can tell you what happens. Uh, Trump happens, right? I mean, that's, that's your implication. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, this is, this is a huge problem, right? But I agree with all of what you've said about what happens, and I mean, I kind of think about this space a lot, but I, what, I, what I think I know is true is that you can't go back, right? Like, the fact that a meme exists is there, right? And the fact that the internet is there and scaled and we all use it and we all can't stop touching our phones is there. You can't just be like, oh, I really don't want a meme to exist. I would prefer that we lived in a world that doesn't have a meme, right? So, like, or, or the internet or whatever. Um, and so I think, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever, the, the, and this is a longer story than memes, right? This is like capitalism or something. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a dynamic, changing world, right, um, that, uh, that constantly throws up different conditions that we have to adapt to. And I think um, we can definitely see a huge amount of negative impact uh, on the dialogic space, on, on governance, on, on whatever, um, of, of social media and its outcomes, i.e. memes. Um, uh, but the way to navigate forward from that um, can't be going back. So it's about acknowledging these systems, understanding them better, which I think we're doing. And I think actually that was one of the cool things I got from watching this Senate hearing last night, is that actually the people working for the Senate kind of know a lot about what's going on now. Whereas like um, a year ago, that was definitely not the case. Um, so um, yeah, um, we need to become more literate and work together and draw together diverse voices, um, diverse knowledge and skill sets, and, and move forward to a place where we design another system that eclipses the next one, you know? So if I may, there's a kind of two thoughts. I'll give you one, um, the one uh, response is uh, the example. So I was at Yahoo a Research Lab when Yahoo was still a cool company, uh, 2006. <laughs> and uh, they just acquired a company called Flickr, many, some of you may know. And they just invented, um, the Yahoo Research Lab invented a uh, layer of service for location-based service. So it was going to be generic layer that would that would be embedded in any kind of service that will not uh, you know identify where you actually did that transaction. They embedded it into Flickr. So first time we could tag our photos with location and also with the keyword. And then they said they found something really bizarre. So they were matching up with the photos and map and keywords. And they said in our uh, Flickr map bridge doesn't exist on Golden Gate Bridge. It is somewhere else. It's two miles away from Golden Gate Bridge. It's on the park that gives you perfect angle, photo angle of Golden Gate Bridge. And when you think about it, it makes perfect sense, right? Nobody will take photo of Golden Gate Bridge on the Golden Gate Bridge. So the, the location tagging actually alter the meeting meaning the location meaning of Golden Gate Bridge. So what happened was Golden Gate Bridge existed on the other side, on the, uh, the, the other side, right, that, that the hill, little park. And then they said, you know, this is the, the guy's thing. You know, like 100 years from now, people may forget that Golden Gate Bridge once was a bridge. It's a little name park that exists on cyberspace. And that is what they called a, a Kodak moment location. This is where you get perfect photo. And then I said, if you play the logic further, why the hell do you need to go to Golden Gate Bridge to, to take the perfect photo? Have you ever thought about it? Like, uh, you know, you, you go around London taking pictures and then you realize, darn, you know, I could just buy all these postcards. <laughs> Or just like take it, right? I mean, yeah. I, I never take pictures of monuments because of exactly that reason. There are much better photos. So, so that's like, a, you know, playing out the logic of technology all the way in and what happens to our understanding of the location and space and geography 
And that's one the, the scary consequence of, of you know, this mimic, uh, you know, mimetic culture. The second part I'd like to come back is uh, we talk a lot about education, building new tools and alternatives. So I've been working on um, the working with the, uh, um, the high school kids in Philadelphia uh, uh, and, and uh, inner city uh, kids, training them with very sort of simple thought that you know the technology lower the entry barrier. Uh, if you can identify a problem in your city and come up with a technology-based solution that works in Philadelphia, it should work in New York, it should work in London, it should work in Mumbai. So you have a shot at of becoming a global entrepreneur by taking, uh, studying your own problem. You know, the entrepreneurship is all about finding right, right problem to solve. So why don't we teach students to do that, right? On the surface, I think it's great, but it, it leaves off this meta language that someone else is controlling. The Google is controlling, the Amazon cloud is controlling. They have to pay a huge amount of money to Amazon if they become successful. So I think as, a, as an educator, the challenge I think I have found today is that you know, it's not enough to teach that digital uh, literacy to the next generation entrepreneurs. I think we really need to work harder to come up with the alternative meta language that goes beyond the current architecture of the internet. And there is a great business opportunity. So uh, you know, there are al some alternatives that uh, you know, I've been involved in and uh, some people are working on, but I think that's you know, both a great uh, opportunity for societal um, advancement as well as a business opportunity. Yeah, and to examine official narratives and find the, the way that they differ from reality, right? I mean, that's exactly, exactly part of the finding that problem is looking very hard at what the, what the tagline is and, and, and kind of like figuring out what's not contained in that tagline. Wow, well, we can't solve the world, but Thinking about thinking about the future, ending on that note, and uh, I think you'll join me in recognizing how stimulating the conversation between these uh, two creative minds um, has been and will continue to be um, as uh, the show shapes up. And uh, we really look forward to Simon being back in the spring and having the exhibition uh, opening here and. Thank you to Young Jin for all that you've brought to, um, well, for me personally, but for the institution to really um, experiment in seeing how this kind of cross-disciplinary dialogue um, has been, uh, I think, really mirrors and demonstrates how vital contemporary art can be to thinking about our world. So thank you to both of you, and thank you all for coming, and join me in thanking them.